Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. My name is David Holloway, and it's brilliant as always to be here with you. And with me, I have the mellifluous Paul Bindig. How are you, sir? Mellifluous. I love that. I love that. Thank you, David. I'm going to have to make an extra effort not to trip over my syllables and use big words now that you've said (laughs) mellifluous. So thank you. That's right. And look, I, I, I'll be honest, um, I, I wanted to use the word, but then had to look it up to make sure that it actually fit. It just means you've got lovely melodic voice. So pretty much. That's <laughs> Which is completely not true, but thank you anyway. <laughs> oh, it's better than mine. So no, great to be here again. And uh, we're very excited to be chatting this episode with Mr. Mitch Town. Now, Mitch is a Grammy-nominated keyboardist and touring musician, and um, he's based in Omaha, Nebraska, isn't it? Apologies for my geography fails, but I'm pretty sure it's Omaha, Nebraska. Um, And he's one killer organ and piano player. Um, And as you'll hear when we talk to Mitch, he's had some amazing experiences. And what I love about this interview is he provides some really brilliant hands-on advice um, on playing that I know I absolutely will be trying to implement some of it. Hey, hey, listeners and viewers, if you want to know how to play left-hand bass on the organ, you are about to get the best yes. life hack you've ever got. And that's all I'm going to say because it will wreck it. You need to hear it coming from Mitch's mouth himself. And, David, speaking of our listeners and viewers, um, we, we put a call out a little while ago about... If you have a band and you would like us to pimp your band via wearing some apparel, we're happy to do it on the podcast. So now this proves what's happening right now, that we will we'll do this for any band as long as the, the apparel isn't rude or have swear words on it or, or things that might offend people. Yes. Um, and, and many of our, our regulars may know that uh, I play in a, a pretty large-scale Pink Floyd tribute in Australia. Well, I have the shirt from another Pink Floyd tribute in Australia. I was over there on tour and I met Gwyn Perrett, who is the keyboard player of this amazing Pink Floyd tribute that are Perth-based called Comfortably Numb. They do a really great job. They play amazing uh, Pink Floyd in really good venues and they get really good crowds. So Absolutely. that's Comfortably Numb, uh, an amazing plan. And so thank you, Gwyn, for the shirt. I'm wearing it with pride. And if you're in Western Australia and you want to see a really excellent Pink Floyd show, you won't be disappointed. They do a, they do a really good job. So we have Pimped Comfortably Numb and thanks for the shirt, mate. It's really good. Excellent. No, great work. And uh, yeah, shout out to Comfortably Numb. So let's jump into our catch up with Mitch Town and see you at the end. Mitch, absolute pleasure to have you on board. Very, very excited to be here. So um, we're, we're excited to have you here as well. I thought uh, we, we do this the odd time. We're going to do a bit of a reverse chronology approach oh. to this show. So I thought we'd okay. actually talk rather than how you started, um, what you're doing right now. You're obviously not finished, but let's no. talk about <laughs> what well, you're you know, doing. It's exciting for me because it's like I kind of I kind of maybe wanting to be like a poster child for late bloomers, you know, because like uh, as opposed to some of the other guests that you've had on, like we talked about earlier, Steve Picaro, Jeff Downs, Tom Schumann, all these amazing keyboard players who've had a, you know, a long career of doing some pretty high profile things. My, uh, my career is sort of taking off recently, you know, as I'm well into my adult life here. Uh, I've formed a trio with uh, one of the greatest drummers, the most recorded session drummer of all time, John J.R. Robinson. Uh, We formed a trio last year with this amazing studio guitar player uh, from LA named Andrew Sinewick. And the group is called SRT. That's you know, harkening back to the ELP, to my ELP fandom days, I suppose. Uh, uh, and it's uh, it's sort of a a power funk rock fusion jazz organ trio. And uh, we recorded an album last year, and uh, now we're going out on tour this year to some far flung places to support it. And uh, I'm just really excited. This is this is really the biggest thing that I've done in in my career up to this point, and uh, you know, and, kind and of over is, the moon it about is, it. It is amazing. We'll be definitely linking to a couple of the, <clears throat> the videos you guys have done. Some great videos, including some live 
videos and so on. And so, um, yeah, I was going to make sort of a, a funny comment about you working with two untested, unknown musicians. Yeah. It's, it's, well, hard, it's, hard, yeah. it's hard to under it's hard to under uh, overstate. Uh, particularly um, John's role in music. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. His 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 resume is just insane. He sent me um, he sent me an Excel spreadsheet that he has uh, that I don't know if he compiled or somebody worked with compiled it of all of his session credits. And so I opened it on my relatively new MacBook Pro, and I I scroll as as I started to scroll through it. The fans on my computer kicked on because the document is so large. It needed that much, you know, power just to get to like, you know, the D and E section of the of the alphabetized list, you know. And uh, I'm going through the list and I'm looking at all these things that 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 he's on. And I texted him. I was like, "Whoa, you're on the album L is for Lover by Al Jarreau. I loved that record." And he texted back, "I am." I'm like, yeah, you're, it says here you're on six tracks, you know? It's like, he's done so much stuff. He's, you know, the old joke about I've forgotten more about music than you'll ever know. He's that guy. He's forgotten more tracks he's done than most of us will ever do, you know? So uh, just to be, because guys like him are, for guys like us, you know, they're they're not the household name. He's not Steve Winwood. He's not Michael Jackson. He's not, but to guys like us, these guys are superheroes. You know, like I said earlier, Steve Picaro, you know, I mean, that guy's on a million records. Those guys are the guys that I grew up idolizing, were the people who did the music, not so much maybe the star, you know, I wasn't as interested. I mean, I love Sting, but I was really into Kenny Kirkland, you know, who, you know, and so to be to just to just to sit with Jr. and 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 listen to his stories, you know, it's like tell me what it was like to play with David Lee Roth. Tell me what it was like to to do the Michael Jackson sessions, you know, because that is the the history of everything that that uh, we've listened to for a majority of our lives. I imagine we're all generally the same age. I mean, you know, you can sometimes I'll play a game where I'll turn on like the 80s station and I'll just count until I hear JR. It's usually two or three songs, you know, it's like, Oh, there it is. You know? And so to just to be, you know, uh, uh, to get to play with someone of that stature is literally a dream come true. And what, what stood out to me, Mitch, we, we obviously won't talk too much about drummers, but um, <laughs> it's, what, what stood out to me is watching some of your videos is JR's um, been in the, the industry, I think he's, he's said himself, for more than 50 years. Yep, yep. But this is not some guy that was a great drummer. This is a guy that still remains an incredibly great drummer. That stood out from the first video I saw. saw. Right, and that's the interesting thing. And I think one of the things that is exciting for him about this project, if, if I could speak for him, it's like JR, if you listen to JR's, the stuff that he's famous for, you know, the entire album Off the Wall, uh, you know, Higher Love, Steve Winwood, uh, you know, uh, All Night Long by Lionel Richie, all the stuff with Shaka Khan, all the stuff with Whitney Houston. JR's a pocket player, right? I mean, it's just groove. It's just solid. That's what that's what pays the bills, right? That's why Quincy Jones, he was Quincy's go-to guy for so long. That's why he's David Foster's go-to guy. <clears throat> it's because of that. But he's a Berkeley cat. I mean, he has chops for days. And in this context, it's like he can he gets to stretch that out and do that kind of stuff, you know? So I think that is one of the things that was attractive to him about this project is it's like, he's not restricted to just, okay, lay it down, you know, keep it 120 beats per minute and do that thing. It's like, he just goes for it. That's right. He sure does. And so t <clears throat> tell us about the album then, Mitch. So what, what, what was that like rec recording that um, as a, as a, well, it's my, you're obviously playing organ and, and bass. Yeah. Tell us a yeah. little bit about the process that you took with that. Well, we had uh, we had talked about doing a trio record, and uh, because uh, we had met, I'll kind of I'll tell you how I met Jr. Um, <clears throat> he had come to Omaha. He tours with uh, with uh, with David Foster, and David Foster would often oddly come to Omaha to do a lot of uh, fundraisers 
for there was a, a gentleman here who was the second richest guy in Omaha. Warren Buffett is the most well, well known, but there was another man called Walter Scott. And whenever he would have a benefit or something like that, he would bring in David Foster. And I don't know how that connection was made initially, but David Foster would come to town all the time. So I went to a show, it was a benefit that uh, David Foster was the MD for, and I was, and Nathan East was playing bass on it, he, you know, because David Foster always brings amazing musicians and singers with him. And I'm out in the audience and I was like, I, I think that that's J.R. Robinson on drums. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm seeing royalty here at this benefit. So after the show, I happened to be near the stage and I, I looked over and there JR was tearing down his, his drum kit, you know, taking his cymbals off. And I walked over and I said, JR Robinson. And he goes, you know who I am? I was like, yeah, I know who you are. You're the guy on X, Y, and Z, you know, and we hit, and we just, you know, we talked for about five minutes. He's from Iowa and I'm from Iowa. So we sort of had that, you know, he's from maybe like an hour and a half from my hometown. So we sort of made that Iowa connection. And being the nice guy he is, he gave me his business card. And I thought, cool, you know, why, what reason would I ever have to call this, you know, the most recorded session drummer of all time, you know? But I thought it was cool that he was, that he gave me his business card. And for the next couple of years, I used it as a bookmark. So, you know, if I'm reading Steve Lukather's book, I've got J.R. Robinson's card, you know, whatever. I thought and it was just a nice meeting. So we fast forward to 2020, you know, and the world shuts down and everything is, you know, and like everybody, I think not everybody, but I think a lot of people were like me and they thought, OK, well, now I've got all this time to, you know, practice. And because I'm always usually practicing for upcoming shows and working on some really hard music. So I got to spend a lot of time on that. I thought, well, now I've got a chance to just, you know, transcribe a bunch of Joey Francesco solos and really work on some stuff, you know. That just didn't happen as much as I wanted it to. You know, I was I was depressed. Everybody was like that. Uh, you know, I watched the I watched Netflix. You know, and played golf on a, on my phone. And every now and then, I would get a couple of weeks where I'd feel inspired to practice. But I was just because what I learned about myself is that I need to have things to look forward to. It's like my entire career has been well, this could happen. And so I got to be ready for this. And I've got a couple gigs coming up here. So I've got to shed this music and I've got to be ready for this. Well, once everything was wiped off the books, you know, I had nothing to look forward to. I had no, I, 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 I'm, I'm not as much of a self starter, I guess, as, 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 as some people. So around about September of that year of 2020, I was watching, I watched the Quincy Jones documentary that's on Netflix and JR is in it. He's interviewed in it, of course, because he was Quincy's guy for quite a bit. And I was like, oh, hey, man, J.R. Robinson, I, I have his business card. Cool, you know. So a couple weeks later, I watch the David Foster documentary. And, of course, J.R.'s in that. And I'm just like, and it just, the wheel started turning. Uh, and I thought, okay, I've got to, you know, the things you know, ideally are going to open up eventually. The, you know, the, the world's going to kick back in. I would need to be planning for stuff now. And I hatched this idea that there's this really great jazz club here in Omaha, The Jewel. It is literally one of the finest clubs in the country. People come from all over and when they play there, they're like, this is one of the nicest clubs. And I'm, and I'm very tight with the management there. I was doing a lot of shows there in 2019 when I, when it opened up with some big jazz names. And they're very flexible with me about, you know, if, if there's a show you want to put uh, together, let us know, you know. So I, I kind of hatched this plan in my head. And I thought, what if I, what if I reach out to J.R. Robinson and suggest a tribute to J.R. Robinson featuring J.R. Robinson and put it together at the Jewel. He's, he, did, he, he grew up not far from Omaha. Maybe he's got family back here. I mean, I'd never talked to the guy other than this one time, right? You know, maybe he could come back for Christmas and then come over to Omaha. You know, what? I, and I thought, what's the worst that, that, that he can say? Is either no or he never responds to me. So I, so I, I put together an email pitch and I said, you know, 
you don't re- I'm sure you don't remember meeting me, but I met you in Omaha and I'm a keyboard player and you know and believe it or not, I can put together a crack band to perform music that you made famous by your drumming by your drum parts. I've got a singer who can sing Whitney and Shaka like nobody's business. Uh, I'd love to do a tribute to you and just feature you in this net. And uh, I attached a couple YouTube clips of me playing so he'd know that at least I knew what I was doing in some respect. And fired off an email, heard nothing. I'm like, okay. So I wait a couple weeks and I call because I've got his, got his phone number. Leave him a voicemail. Nothing. I'm like, okay. Shot my shot. Whatever. You know, move on. About a month later, I was, you know, Facebook friends with him. He'd posted something on Facebook, and it got me thinking about it again. So I thought, okay, I'm going to take one more shot here. And I, and I emailed him one more time and said, hey, have you gotten a chance to think about this? Let me know. And it hits me back with the shortest email ever. It says, I love this idea. We need to wait for a vaccine. Hit me in four months. I was like, great. <laughs> I will hit you in four months to the day. So we finally got in touch in early 2021 and got on the phone. And he's a super nice guy. I mean, we hit it off just like that, you know, and we're talking about, we started to talk about the uh, the material for the show. I sent him, I sent him YouTubes of everybody that I was going to, you know, the bass player and the guitar player. And I, I mean, there are some amazing musicians around here. And uh, I sent him a clip of the singer you know, and uh, we basically planned it the whole year and did it in December of 2021. And we packed the jewel for two sold out shows and everybody that I hired for it just, I mean, knocked it out of the park. He was thrilled. He just thought it was, he just loved it, you know, and he was very happy. And it was one of the best shows of my whole life. And it was, and, and he, so after that, he wanted to take this particular thing on the road. You know, and do the J.R. Robinson experience is what he was going to call it. Now, you're talking five, six people. And that's that's a lot of money. <clears throat> so, you know, we tried to set up a couple things, but the budgets weren't right and this and that. So in the meantime, you know, he, he, he and I were staying in touch. And we'd become very, you know, close friends really quick. And so early on in 2022, I said, uh, you know, have you ever thought about doing an organ trio record? You know, because I'm a keyboard player, but I'm an organ. My specialty is Hammond organ. And uh, and he said, "Yeah, I thought about it." And I said, "Well, I know an organ player." And he said, "Well, I know a drummer." I said, "Well, let's do this." And so then we started to talk about what to do for a third, what the you know what the what what the whole plot for the band should should be. And uh, and he said, "I've got the guy." And it's, he's this amazing session player named Andrew Sinewick. And uh, <clears throat> what I tell people about that is Andrew is a professional session guitar player in L.A. in 2022, now 2023. Mm-hmm. This, isn't the, this isn't the 80s where there's a million sessions and, you know, work for everybody. That's a small cut of the pie and he is that good that he's the guy who gets called for movies and TV soundtracks and albums and, you know, gigs at the Hollywood Bowl. And, you know, I mean, he's that good. To be a session player now, you got to be at the top of your game. And he and JR had met because they had done um, a version, a new version of Staying Alive for the Bullet Train soundtrack, which is a Brad Pitt movie that came out last year. So they'd met on that session. And he's like, I got the guy, you know, and we'd reach out to him and he was super into it. So we set up just some Zoom sessions to talk about it. And Andrew wrote three or four songs and I wrote two or three songs and JR wrote a couple and we uh, collaborated like, you know, JR had some chord changes. And so Andrew wrote ahead to one of them, you know, so there's there's a whole bunch of collaboration on the record and there is... I'll tell you what, the thing about Andrew Sinewick is he is a stylistic chameleon. Uh, there's, there's, there's funk, there's shredding rock, there's straight ahead jazz, there's, you know, uh, trippy stuff. He plays it all, not just well, but with authority. It's like you'd think he was a jazz player on the straight ahead tune. 
you know, you'd think he was, you know, a, a, a shredder on that tune, Talshaya, that you got, you know, he is, he's all of those things, you know, he's just one of those versatile guys that can play anything, and so it's like, that just opens up the world to what you can do in a band when you have a musician like that who can just, anything you throw at him, I could probably throw him a banjo part if I, you know, and he'd probably kill that, you know, so that was, so that was, um, that was how we set that up, and we we scheduled it to record at a studio in L.A. in July. And I'm finally getting back around to what you'd said 20 minutes ago about, you know, that I was going in with guys who were, you know, what, however you joked about it, you know, not too experienced or whatever. So for me, here I am going, I haven't spent a ton of time in the studio like a lot of people. Uh, so here I am going into the studio with, J.R. Robinson and Andrew Sinewick, who these guys make their life in the studio, and the studio has always been somewhat of a dragon to me. You know, it's like I've done so many gigs, and uh, and I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, this is one of the things I thought I would bring up in this podcast because because my angle on things is a little different than maybe someone who's had a long, huge career is uh, is uh, the importance of seeing a therapist. Because I started to see a therapist about five years ago, and it absolutely changed my musical life. It really, it really opened me up as far as being able to just be more free as a musician and to not... I think musicians are either in one of two camps. They're either extremely egotistical and think that they're the shit, or they're just stuck in self-loathing. You know, and I think there's there's not too many people in between there. You know, I think I think especially in in like jazz, a lot of guys hate themselves. It's like because you don't sound like Coltrane, you don't sound like whatever. You know, you don't sound like Wayne Shorter. You know, you know there there's so many playing against ghosts. I think is what Kenny Kenny Werner says about it. It's like you're competing with ghosts when you're trying to do that kind of music. And I was on the self loathing side. It's like nothing I did was good enough. And you know, and and I ended up seeing a therapist and she really zeroed in on a lot of those things. And the kind of the final hurdle was performing in the studio. It's like red light fever. You know, it's like I've played with some monster players live and done great. And it's whatever. And then it's like, click, that studio goes on. You're like, you know, it's like, and so this was like, okay, this is like the final boss in a game. You know, it's like, I'm going into the studio with two of the greatest session musicians on the planet and it went it went well you know it was i felt you know in in my in my development as a musician i've always wanted to be like the fourth best guy in the quartet or the third best guy in the trio you know because that's where you learn that's where you know it's fun to it's fun once in a while to be the best guy but you know it's better to be to be the bringing up the the back of the pack as far as as far as your talent level in the band and in this session with these guys it's like I was obviously the third best guy without a doubt but at the same time it's like I had this sense of belonging you know it's like okay yeah I'm supposed to be here this is this is a situation that I have prepared for <clears throat> and I'm ready to go and it was a really wonderful experience uh, Mitch, th thanks for being so candid uh, about what that experience is like because, you know, when we've had previous guests on here who ha have also admitted to a bit of that, you know, I'll call it imposter syndrome, which we can all suffer from sometimes. No, which absolutely, it's, totally. You know, and, and listeners and viewers, make no mistake, Mitch is being very glowing about his, his colleagues in SRT, but I can tell you Mitch is a serious player. <laughs> and it gives us all a bit of confidence Thank at whatever you. level that we play at that we... Um, Sometimes we do suffer from self-doubt and it's a normal part of the human condition and it's, it's something that we all have to work on. So I, I really appreciate you being so candid about that. That's, um, that's fantastic. Um, but, but let's talk a bit about you. And um, I, I just wanted to call out that in the, the SRT stuff, there is some amazing left-hand bass work going on uh, oh, with, with what you. you're doing there. Uh, yeah, and, and I guess that's not unusual for good Hammond players, but it, it's certainly very noticeable in this group. And we're curious as to, you know, what's your approach to that? And as someone who personally uh, 
no good at it at all. Love, love to learn how you how you think <laughs> about it and how you how you go about creating uh, uh, some some really interesting baselines there. Well, I'll tell you how I started out. It's it's one of my favorite stories because when I when I first really got serious about playing Hammond, I was probably in my twenties, and uh, this is back in the early days of AOL, right? And the early days of chat boards and that kind of thing, and and what you and because the Hammond organ up until I don't know the last fifteen or twenty years with the advent of the internet, of course, the Hammond organ was sort of a dark art. You know, you had to know somebody who could even show you how to turn the damn thing on, let alone what you're doing with the draw bars and all that stuff. You know, you couldn't even figure out how to turn the thing on if someone didn't show you. So, you know. It, uh, um, unless you grew up in the church or around another ham and organ player, you didn't know anything about it. And I just knew I loved that sound, and I always gravitated towards it. If we end up talking about, you know, how I started out in in music, we'll talk about that. But around the around like the mid or my mid twenties is when I thought, okay, I, I was playing at a church that had just got a Hammond organ. I'm like, I'm going to finally learn how to do this because I had I'd been checking out Joey D Francesco around that time because he is the he's single-handedly responsible for bringing that instrument back into the forefront i mean he is my greatest musical influence of many but joey d is probably the person i've listened to more than anything and you know losing joey d is an absolute loss to the to the world and Huge. um and to just know that there's that he's not going to be creating anything new is just heartbreaking but the amount of work that he did up to that point and what he did for the instrument that's i mean I credit him for the reason there's so many Hammond organ players in jazz now is because Joey kicked that door back open. So anyway, so I was really in, so I wanted to learn how to play Hammond. And this was back in the early days of AOL. And they were there, there was a Yahoo group uh, dedicated like to, to like Hammond organ and mostly tech. And I think it was called Ham Tech was, but, but it also, but there was also players on there who talked about stuff. And I got involved on that because I was trying to do as much research about the organ as possible. And I ended up meeting, and I might, by like meeting, I mean in the chat room, this literal guru of the Hammond organ named Sal Azzarelli. And Sal was an organ tech out of Buffalo. He could, he was also a player, but he never wanted to play. He was always, he was a tech. He was one of those guys that could tear a Hammond organ down to the, down to the wires and build it back. You know what I mean? Build it from scratch. And he was actually Joey D. Francesco's main tech, but Sal was a presence on these boards, and he was uh, he was an interesting character, man. He was like he was a total stereotypical East Coast Italian guy, who super opinionated, but also very open with information to anyone who had an honest uh, interest in learning. So he and I started doing you know instant message chats, you know, and. He, I, I tell people to this day, Sal Azzarelli taught me how to play organ over the phone. Because he would, we would get on the phone and he'd call me like, hey, Mitch, hey, it's Sal. How you doing? You know, I mean, it was literally like that. You know, he was, he was just a beautiful, wonderful stereotype. And because uh, he loved to talk about Goodfellas and uh, The Godfather. I mean, we, we, we spent more time talking about movies than we did the organ. But I remember asking him, I said, Sal. Because I was, I was a piano player. I was a jazz piano player. And uh, so left hand's for comping, right? You know, I didn't do any walking shit. I didn't play stride. Left hand was, I came from the Bill Evans, Herbie thing. It's like left hand is comping, right hand solely. And I was, you know, I hear, you hear what Joey's doing and Jimmy Smith and those guys are all playing left hand bass and pedals. You know, I was like, Sal, how do I, how do I even begin to try to do that? To this day, I remember this, and I will tell, if I ever have an organ student, this is what I tell them. He said, all right, I want you to take your right hand and sit on it for six weeks and do nothing but play an F blues bass line, a jazz bass line with three, six, two, five in it, in the, in the turnaround, you know. Do, don't, don't, don't touch the keyboard with your right hand. Don't try to solo. Don't try to comp chords. Just walk that bass line for six weeks. And at the end of six weeks, I want you to be able to walk an F blues and tell me a joke at the same time. So that's what I did. And what I understood later 
to be the reason for that is the left hand has to be for a certain for a, a considerable amount on autopilot and you go by feel and an f blues is perfect because you're walking those changes and then you then you start to learn what a two five feels like you know how your fingers move on a two five <clears throat> and the joke is your solo so as you're telling the joke you're keeping that baseline it you can do it without thinking because you're thinking about the joke and i'll be damned if that wasn't wasn't the thing that unlocked it for a person that had no idea how to walk a baseline it ends up being a lot of feel and autopilot and so then i just started going through the real book and walking through tunes and just like i learned how to play jazz piano it was a page by page of the real book okay here's stella by starlight here's turn out the stars here's you know whatever uh I just started doing that and learning and getting how that feels under my fingers, how two fives feel, how octaves feel, how that, how that feels. And that's what got me started to at least be able to function as a bass player. Cause I, I feel like Hammond organ playing Hammond organ in a, in a jazz context like that is a little bit of a tightrope walk. You know, I mean, you're kind of going out there cause if it falls apart, you don't have a bass player to follow. If I don't know the tune, if, if somebody starts to play a tune that I don't know, I'm screwed because I can't listen to anybody else to figure out what the change. If the horn player starts playing, you know, the the song is you and I don't know the bridge, I'm out to lunch. I can't follow the bass player, you know. So uh, that is, it's sort of a tightrope walk, but at the same time, I love that. I love the direct connection to the drummer. I love the amount of uh, power I have harmonically. If I want to pedal, if I want to, you know, put the third in the bass, if I want to, you know, uh, reharm something, I, it's done. It's instant. You know, it's in my head. I can do it. You know, so it, there's just something that I'm more attracted to about playing organ than playing piano, for instance, in a jazz context. You know, I'm just, I feel like I'm, it's just more home to me. So to get to, the, that's the long way to get around to your question is that not is I also I try to think like a bass player uh the best compliments that I will get that I've gotten from drummers is that I don't feel like I'm playing with an organ player I feel like I'm just playing with a bass player because you know organ bass can be a certain thing it's repetitive and this and that uh and a lot of it is like we just said it gets on autopilot but there's there's times where you can like kick that part of your brain in and do a thing and then and then kick it off you know it's it's like i can't explain how it works i just know i can do it because i've listened to so much it's like i'm imitating if you listen to joey d he's not playing he's playing like a bass player he's doing that kind of thing so i listen to a lot of bass players so in the srt context it's not a lot of straight ahead there's like you know there, there's a lot of funk and there's a lot of you know r and b and and so it's not just walking lines so i'm trying to think like you know what would what would you know name me a bass player what would what what would marcus miller play here what would rocco priesta do what would pino paladino do it's like i'm trying to think like a bass player and not a keyboard player in those instances so so for SRT, it's really those moments where I'm trying to feel like a fusion bass player, you know, that kind of thing. And just, just kind of executing it as I feel it. There's nothing on there when I went in saying, okay, I'm going to play this exact bass line. You know, it's like, it's just kind of like, let's just see what happens. So there's nothing on that on the record that I'm that I came in thinking, okay, I'm going to play this particular line right here or anything like that. Uh, it's just all... I'm just thinking stylistically and spur of the moment, what would Pino Palladino do or what might Marcus Miller do or Rocco Priester or all the things that I've listened to, what would Herbie Hancock do in that section, you know, on a, uh, on a, on an ARP base or something. And it just kind of just happens in the moment. So, so Mitch, I've got a follow-up question. Is there a similar Mr. Miyagi style trick that you learned to, uh, again, as a piano <laughs> player moving to become a, a great organ player to learn the foot pedals side of things which would be another unusual thing for a, for a pianist to have to deal with that's yeah that's not my you know 
uh, the interesting, like the difference between gospel organ and jazz organ, because there's a there's a misconception that jazz organ guys are walking bass lines totally with their feet. That's not true. I think Jimmy, the you know, people always say that <clears throat> that Jimmy Smith was doing that, but he wasn't. And I think he liked to make people think he was, but he wasn't because the real swing is in the hand is in the left hand. Uh, the pedals in jazz organ are for emphasis. And you could walk each one if you work on it, but that's really not going to swing. The swing's really going to come from your left hand. The pedal's there for emphasis. You tap along, uh, maybe on one pedal to cut. It gives it, um, it gives it a thud. It gives it like the pluck of a bass. So if I sat down at the organ and just and just played a left hand bass line, you'd think that sounded fine. But if I add the foot, tap along there, it gives it that 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 pluck. That thud is what they called it. I think uh, Jack McDuff called it the thud, you know, and whereas gospel organ players, you know, Hammond organ players play left hand with their, or play bass with their left hand, or play on the bottom manual and solo on the top manual, and gospel players do it the exact other way. They play left, you know, uh, they play their bass lines on the top manual, all the stuff on the bottom, and they walk almost everything with their feet. So I am not good enough to do that. But I do a lot of work with the pedals as an emphasis point. So <clears throat> I think maybe what you'll hear a lot is I'll be doing something, all of a sudden you'll hear a big ga 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 that kind of thing. That's really where I'm dropping in the pedals. You know, I'm walking along with each one kind of, but I'm doing a lot of like single note tapping. But I just kind of instinctively <clears throat> know when to drop those in, or it's like I feel it in a certain way. And all of that comes from listening. That comes from listening to Joey D, from, to, uh, to Jimmy Smith. Chester Thompson from Tower of Power is a huge influence on me. And he, is, I mean, his left, he, 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 he comes a little, he's like, he's like the ultimate mix of gospel and jazz organ players. You know, he could do both of those things extremely well. So hearing that foot pedal thing, it just comes from a lot of listening and yeah, there's time where you just do nothing but sit there and watch your foot and walk a, you know, walk a major scale in every key and then go chromatics and then maybe try to tap along with a bass line. But you can't do your bass line entirely all the way up because your foot won't go all the way up that far. You know, you, you run out of room. So it's just, I'm not the greatest pedal player. I can do it well enough that it sounds right when I'm doing it, I think, you know, but... Uh, yeah, there's. I don't know if there's a, necessarily a hack for that other than set the metronome to really slow and just walk them and just get them under your feet instead of under your fingers. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, <laughs> I love that. And um, look, that, that, that piece of advice prior about the left hand and sitting on the right hand alone, I want to start that right now. It works. Yeah, um, it works. Yeah, it absolutely that's works. Brilliant. I'll see you um, in six weeks, so, David. I expect big improvement in six weeks, mate. The yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> Pick it. Hey, look, pick a good joke. <laughs> Make sure it's a good joke. That's right. <laughs> no, I love that a lot. Um, and so you, you sort of covered uh, what COVID was like for you. So I'm just interested yeah. in those couple of years in the lead up to that. It sounded like you were you were quite busy. Was that <clears throat> when your well, own organ trio was underway? And I'll, so I'll, I'll I'll tell you kind of what my development was up to that point. At a certain time, you know, I think. And this is maybe something I can speak to uh, from a, a, a unique standpoint from maybe some of your other guests is that, like I said earlier, it's like I haven't had this career that was just like, OK, I'm 22 and I'm on the road with Billy Joel or I'm, you know, doing that kind of thing. It's like I uh, I was a, you know, pretty good keyboard player, you know, for my area, and I guess. And and, you know, we all had our aspirations and hopes and dreams but then life kind of gets in the way you know and and you hit your 30s and you know you haven't you know moved to new york or you haven't moved to la you haven't done a thing you're still not too far from your hometown and you know you're gigging but you know like i said life gets in the way you, you maybe got a day job you got a family you got that kind of thing and you start to start to go to seed right and i think a lot of people i think that's the majority of of musicians you know there's the the one and two percent that have major professional careers and then there's the people that are you know weekend warriors or you know or they play at their church or they do that kind of thing and but you know the one thing that i remember from college is that somebody said you know if you're not growing you're dying 
And I really felt like for a while throughout my throughout my 30s that I just really wasn't getting anywhere. And, you know, there were, you know, people that had come over and maybe had had a couple lessons with me that then all of a sudden were becoming really good and getting better than me. And it was, you know, it was one of those things that I kind of struggled with, uh, you know, with ego and pride. And it's like, you know, I started to sort of like recede a little bit from, you know, who it was that I wanted to be when I was a kid, you know. So come up to about 2012 and I had a really, a really good friend who, uh, who had gone to school here at, uh, in, he got his master's here in, in, in Omaha, this amazing trombone player named Marcus Lewis. And Marcus had left Omaha and he'd gone to tour with Janelle Monet and with the Ohio players and he'd moved to New York. And Marcus was an amazing, is, was, is an amazing trombone player. And he's also a, an incredible composer. And so I had run into him. <clears throat> uh, he'd come back to Omaha because he married a girl from from Omaha, so he was back visiting her family around then. And we ran into each other, and uh, I said, man, I would love to hook up with you sometime. You know, I'd love to play sometime. And he said, well, actually, I've got a record coming out in, in 2012, and I want to come through, and I want to do a release party for it here in Omaha. Would you, I'd love to have you play on it, play piano on it. I was like, great, that sounds awesome. So a couple months later, he sends me the music, it's the hardest stuff I'd ever seen. You know, it was modern jazz in all of its glory. You know, ridiculous chord changes that I didn't know how to voice. Mixed meters. You know, I mean, it was far beyond a standards gig, right? And I was just like, wow. You know, I was really intimidated. Because I was playing a lot of organ then, and my, and my piano chops had kind of gone by the wayside, but this gig was a piano gig, so... So I looked at this really hard-ass music, and he was going to do it with some local guys, me and this amazing drummer here named Dana Murray, who's an old friend of mine, and he's a monster. He was in New York for a while. He's an incredible player. And uh, he was going to be on the gig, and he was going to be bringing this young saxophone player from New York with him named Adam Larson, who was pro a prodigy, right? So I read through, I, I shed this music as much as I can, you know, I mean, I wasn't comfortable in playing in seven at that time, or five, or or going from seven eight to six eight bar, you know, switching bars like that. I was just like, holy sh, you know, I was just. But I made it through the gig, you know. I got through the gig, with in my mind, New York guys, because to me, New York was always this sort of, oh, you know, because I was gonna maybe move there after college, but I didn't like the city, so New York is this like this intimidating, oh, New York players, you know. Because they're all freaking great. New York is New York. There's a reason it is, it is what it is. But I never wanted to move there because I didn't like the city. But anyway, I got through this gig and I'd held my own with these guys. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I thought to myself, okay, I just proved that I can at least hang on for dear life. What if I really, really rededicated myself to music? and really started practicing again. Let's just, and the, my only goal, guys, was let's just see how good I can become. I didn't have any other aspirations for anything else other than, at that moment, other than let's just see how good I can get. And for me, it was also one of those moments where I had to, I felt like I had to pick an instrument. There are some guys who can play organ and keyboards and piano really well. You know, uh, Larry Goldings comes to mind. He, he's killer on both. Brian Charette's another one. But I have always felt like you're either an organ player who tries to play piano or a piano player who tries to play organ. And I had to decide which one I wanted to be. And I, re I decided that I wanted to be an organ player who tries to play piano. <laughs> and I just dedicated all of my shed time to the organ, starting in 2012, and just said, okay, I'm going to take a run at this and see what happens. 
and I started to really shed and I started and I and I, I, I started to do some online lessons with an amazing organ player uh, Pat Bianchi I don't know if you've heard of Pat but he is one of the greats and uh, he's a mentor to me and a dear friend and I just really decided to stop and f forgive the fr to stop bullshitting myself because before I was like, well, yeah, you know, maybe some opportunities will happen and I'll, you know, I wasn't ready for any of that. I wasn't. I wasn't ready for those opportunities. I had to get ready for those opportunities and be really honest with what about my playing wasn't happening. What wasn't working? What did I need to improve on? I took time and just, I got out the David Baker How to Play Bebop book and just read through and just started to just get bebop things under my fingers just just to be like just ego aside and go okay start building from the you know from the ground up and uh then you know a couple years later it's like I started to sort of expand out regionally I started to go to over to Des Moines and play and then I got involved in the Kansas City scene and the Kansas City scene there are some amazing musicians in Kansas City but that's what I just started to do. It's like I just started to try to get into situations where, as I said earlier, I was the third best guy by far in the group. I would drive hundreds of miles just to play a $50 gig just to have the experience of playing with these guys. And so the trajectory of my career just started to go like that. You know, it's like all of a sudden now people know me in a couple other cities and now I'm, you know, people are starting to know me a little bit on Facebook and I'm posting some things, you know, and, and it just, it just started to organically grow. And then I got very blessed to perform on a record, uh, by an artist named Terrace Martin, who, uh, I, uh, his father, Curly Martin was from Omaha and Terrace is a major, instrumentalist and producer from LA worked he he produced to pimp a butterfly by Kendrick Lamar you know and he came to Omaha to perform or to record a record with his father he asked me to just come in and hang out at the studio I happened to be there one day where he said Mitch go out into the control room I get on the organ I got a tune for you to play on so I went out there and did that you know and that tune ends up on the on the record that record gets nominated for a Grammy you know it's like it's like but none of that would have happened if I wouldn't have been honest with myself and started to really prepare and get my shit together, you know, and really dedicate myself to it again. And so roundabout, so to get back to your question, I give you a really long answer to these questions, yeah, but I always remember, I always remember where we're going. So around about 2019, Brian McKenna, uh, uh, an artist manager and uh, former head of Sony Studios, moved to Omaha and opened a jazz club. And he and I developed this kind of partnership, and he said to me, who do you want to play with? We'll bring them in. So all of a sudden, as I said to you earlier, it's like these New York guys are who I judge myself against. I didn't want to be Omaha good. I wanted to be good compared to everybody i wanted to try to hold my own with with the with the cats so all of a sudden i had an opportunity to bring in you know saxophone players like joel Fromm, and i got to play with jerry Berganzi, who are these they're legends uh i uh dan wilson is one of the greatest guitar players out there right now he was in joey d francesco's band i got to play gigs with troy roberts who was the tenor player in joey d francesco's band i got to play with george flutus who toured with joey d you do you see a theme i started to bring in people that i knew and played with you know like joey d's band it's like i wanted to put myself in that position in a, a in a seat that there's no way i could ever fill joey's shoes but yet put myself with those players and test myself against that. And so 2019 was just a real period of like, you know, growth for me and a, 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 like a real explosive time when things were really kicking and I was starting to play with some people and, you know, people that would come in and they would play with me. They'd be like, Hey, I want to take you to play at this other place. I'm like, that's what I want. I want to get my, just get my reputation out there, get my name out there a little bit so people know that there's somebody here in Omaha who can do this particular thing that I do. That's one thing about playing organ, which I think is a little special. It's like, you know, there's there's killer piano players everywhere. 
I mean, it, you, you know, you, you can't spin around without running into a great piano player. There's not as many great organ players. It's like it's like a specialty thing, you know. And I wanted to be able to 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 play the organ in a context of not just straight ahead swing, but to be able to play modern stuff. That's why I spent this time working on Marcus's stuff. That's one of the things I told Marcus after that very first gig. I said, hey, the next time we do this, I want to play organ. I want to do all this stuff. And this gets back to your question uh, about, Paul, about how I develop my bass lines. Part of it is I worked on this really hard st- music, this really modern jazz of Marcus Lewis and Adam Larson that uh, they play with some of the best in the biz- best bass players and best piano players in the business. So I had to take those songs and somehow squeeze those parts into an organ part. I had to take the best part of the piano part and the best part of the bass part and somehow figure out what the most important things are, how to voice these ridiculous chords with one hand. It's like, what are the most important tones? And keep that bass stuff going and moving along. So that's how my development came for those bass lines, was working on this really hard stuff and putting myself in extremely uncomfortable positions, you know? so. So back to 2019, everything's going along great. Then the pandemic kind of shuts everything down, and that's when we got to the story I told you earlier. But basically, my career trajectory has been late in life. Late in life was when I decided, okay, let's try this one more time. Let's just see how good I can get. And I could have never picked or figured out what was going to happen. The, you know, the JR thing, it's like I'd have never called JR if the pandemic wouldn't have happened. You know, I wouldn't have reached out about that, but it's like I needed something to do, and that idea came to me, and it has turned into one of the greatest opportunities of my entire life. So, And there's hope for us yet, Paul. Uh, well, yeah, well, maybe, <laughs> for you, maybe for you, David. Um, you know, I, I'm getting a really strong uh, theme to <laughs> listening to, to your talk there, Mitch, about work ethic, too. So it's... It's uh, you know doing the work yeah. so that w- when an opportunity comes up, you are actually the right guy. And you know, as you said, Mitch, pu- you know, pushing pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, but but knowing you've done the work so that you'll survive in those situations. So I think that's uh, that's a really great takeaway. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, what's a question that no one's ever asked you about your career that you that you just wish someone would? <laughs> uh Nobody ever asks, hey, how's the organ? Do you like the organ? Like when you go to a gig and you're playing a house organ, nobody ever says, do you like the organ? It's like, oh, there it is. You know, and that's the thing about Hammond organs is they're like, they're like guitars and pianos in a way. They're all different, right? So one of them may look amazing and it plays like crap. Or, or it looks like a piece of crap and it plays like a million dollars. You know, no one's ever like, do you like the organ? Can we get you a different organ if this one doesn't work? But <laughs> oddly enough, I did a session with SRT. We did a session on the drum channel for uh, DW Drums a couple months ago. We did a recording session for them and they brought in Backline and they actually brought two organs. I, In case one of them wasn't right, I could have used the other one. And I was like... Somebody gets me. <laughs> Somebody yeah, understands understand. the understand. plight. Be- because, you know, that's the thing. One of the great, like, I think, uh, you know, sadnesses of my music career is that unlike guitar players or saxophonists or, you know, drummers, I don't ever get to play on the, on the instrument I practice. The a my Hammond organ that I practice on and spent all my time on never gets out to a gig. You know, I have to play whatever's there, or I have to play a clone. You know, and the clones are getting better and better all the time. I could we could do a whole podcast on clones. You know, but it's never the real thing. And but that's the thing about the jewel that is so great is I found a couple years ago uh, an A one hundred Hammond A one hundred. For those of you who don't know much about Hammonds B threes. Are the that's what everybody you know is is the gold standard, but A one hundreds are the same thing in a different case. And there's an old Sal told me the old saying that the best B threes are A one hundreds, and I have an A one hundred that is just the holy grail for how it sounds and how it plays. And I overpaid for it, and I don't care because it's it's my favorite instrument I've ever owned, and I put that 
at the jewel. It lives at the jewel. So because I figured if I'm if that's the place where I'm going to play with all these guys that are coming in from out of town and all and that I want to have every advantage possible. I want to have the best instrument I can possibly have. So the jewel is definitely my home away from home with that particular organ there. And I've got an A100 right here, always within always within reach, you know, that is a really good one too. And that's what I practice on. But we but we don't get to perform on the instrument like like if you're a piano player and you have your particular Steinway at, at home, you never get to play that on a session or on a gig, you know, unless you're someone like David Page, who I heard a podcast where he talked about he would bring his Baldwin from home into the studio <laughs> to record with Toto. But not everybody has that, you know, has no, that pull. No, that's excellent. No, great response. And and um, Mitch, I think I feel like you've already passed on some absolutely brilliant key lessons. But anything else as far as key lessons you'd pass on to other players? I, I it's okay. Yes, one of the. I think it's important because we are we. No matter what instrument you play, you will never cover everything. There's no way you will cover every aspect or every style that your instrument can do, right? You'll, if you're a piano player, you're never going to get Oscar Peterson and Art Tatum and Billy Joel and all that. You're, you, you just got to... I think it's very... So it, and if you take that down to a granular level, if you're a musician and there's things... If you're a player and there's things that you want to add to your playing, it, it can be overwhelming to feel like, oh, I got to work bass lines. Oh, I got to work my comping. Oh, I got to work my bebop. Oh, I got to work on my time. Oh, I got to... Yeah, and you, I, and I think you end up practicing a little bit on each of those all the time, and you don't improve, you know. And so I feel like, like I said earlier, I, 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 I decided you know, a big aspect of Joey DeFrancesco's playing that I love is his utilization of bebop and just the bebop language, which is really, that's what, you know, the jazz sounds like that. If you, if you play a bebop line, all of a sudden, oh, I sound like jazz, you know? And I didn't have that in my playing as much as I should have at that point of my, of my playing career. So I was like, all right, I'm just gonna get the, this, this David Baker book out and I'm just going to learn the basics of bebop and I'm going to do nothing but get that under my fingers until I feel like I'm somewhere with it. And I concentrated just on that. So, you know, I think there's a saying from a TV show, it's like, don't half-ass a bunch of things, whole-ass one thing. You know, put your, put your, just get that thing in your playing. If you're, if you're like, wow, there's this thing that Herbie Hancock does that I really like. Don't do anything else for a while. Just get that thing happening. And for a minute, you're going to sound like Herbie Hancock. You know, it's like, oh, and once, if you can sound like Herbie for a bar or sound like Chick for two bars, it gets this belief in your head that, okay, I can sound like Chick Corea for two bars. You know, let's say I can sound like Chick Corea for three bars or four bars, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a thing that you're better at than you were before. And you can, you can, fall back on the fact, well, I got a bebop thing I can do here. You, you know, so you have to identify parts of your playing that either are, um, that you need to improve on or that you want to add, like a piece of language or a, or a concept that you want to add to your playing. Just focus on that for a while. See, the great thing about being an organ player is even while I was working the bebop stuff, I was still playing a bass line. So my, I was still working the bass lines just as habit, you know, but I was really concentrating on nothing other than just da 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 do da da be da 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 do dee da da, you know, doing surrounds and getting that thing and just taking the time to get that under my fingers. And now, you know, those things are there. You know, I'm not like I'm a killer bebop player or anything, but I've got those tools, you know, then so then later it's like, okay, now let's work on whole tones or whatever it is. Really, really take take a granular focus on a particular thing and just stick with that for a while and get that one thing down yeah great no that's a great great point on top of the other excellent ones thanks mitch and so and it's slightly different question uh your go-to keyboards i think you've already made one very very clear and that's the a100 but what what yep. are your other go-to pieces of <clears throat> gear that you love i uh uh i also love playing electric piano uh uh 
I love playing piano too, but my chops are starting to where they, I kind of, I started practicing piano again quite a bit uh, in the last half of this last year. Um, but it, it's so funny. If I stop practicing piano, I don't hear the same things when I play piano that I do on organ. And I, I haven't ever quite figured out why that is. Um, but if I don't play piano for a while, my chops go out the window. It's like all of a sudden I stop think I stop knowing how to think as a piano player. And I'm still thinking like an organ player. But um, I I was an uh, as far as like a clone organ goes. For for when I don't have an organ, I'm an endorsing artist and brand ambassador for Mag organs, which are made out of Czechoslovakia, which use the HX3 as their brains, and they're just a wonderful keyboard. So that's my go-to for when I can't play a real organ. I use Mags. I am a huge fan of the Krumar 7 for uh, road sounds. It is the most realistic fake roads. There's something magic about that thing because it, it uses a key bed that's not really, it's the, it's the Fatar TP100 and it's a very heavy, clunky key bed. It's like I played one of those, I think they use those in the Nord Electro HPs and I hated it. It's like I tried it once, I was like, get that thing away from me. It feels like you're trying to walk through mud. But something about the physical modeling roads and that TP100, it makes me, it suspends disbelief in me and makes me feel like I'm playing a real rose. It inspires me. The sound is great. So that's my go-to on a gig is that is the Crew Mar 7 for, for road sounds. And Mitch, look, couldn't agree more. And I, I had the pleasure of owning a Crew Mar 7 for a number of years and only recently sold it. And the reason I sold it is because any digital piano of that uh, quality is wasted on me as a weekend warrior but <laughs> also I was gigging enough and I know, I'm sure this has improved because I had a very early model it for me it was reliability I actually That's, was scared to take the thing out I on feel the road. you I don't I feel I was I was yeah yeah the less said about that the better yeah I get it I get it but fortunately <laughs> mine mine has been pretty solid and uh I, I love it I love the sound it's very it is, it's inspiring a beautiful piece again. Yeah, yeah super yeah. inspiring I don't play a lot of synth stuff. I'm, I'm not a tweaker. I'm not a knob tweaker. You know, I just, I did that for a while, but it's just not, I'm not a synthesis guy. Uh, you know, I just, I, I'm more of the old school organic instruments kind of thing. You know, I like playing synth leads once in a while, but I'm not, I'm not someone who knows their way around an oscillator or anything like that. You know, you're, uh, you, you're, you're whole assing the uh, organ and the piano and, and not the uh, half assing <laughs> the synth. Exactly. Right? exactly. <laughs> I've learned a new expression. I love this. Exactly. I'd totally be half assing the synth. <laughs> so, so, Mitch, uh, we ask all our guests this question, which is uh, to tag yep. a keyboard player. In other words, who, who is someone that you, you would love to see interviewed on this podcast, potentially? I got two. I got two. I mentioned one of them earlier Pat, Pat Bianchi is uh, one of, he's, you know, he's the foremost jazz organ player out there right now, in my opinion. I love Pat. He's a monster player. Um, definitely Pat, Pat Bianchi. And the other person that I wanted to mention was uh, a, a, young, a keyboard player based out of L LA named Nick Semrod. Now, earlier in this interview, I mentioned... Um, people that had come over and taken a couple lessons from me who immediately got better than me. That's Nick Semrod. Nick is from around here. You're now you're laughing, Dave. Do you know, Nick, do you, do no, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, well, I've made one attempt, but a long time ago to get Nick on the show. So maybe we'll need to do a mutual introduction. I'll do that for you. Nick, I tell you what, man, that guy, he, you want to talk to a synth player. I mean, he's a monster yeah. player on piano stuff, but his thing, he's been touring with Corey Henry for the last seven or eight years That's doing, right. you know, synth and keys with Corey Henry. Nick, it, Nick's one of my heroes, man. He is, he is a cat who can just, uh, you know, he is, talk about a guy who had a practice ethic. Nick, Nick, uh, Nick's a hero to me. I, and we're good friends. Uh, I've just, he's definitely someone you need to have on the show. He is amazing. Yeah. He was, he has definitely toured with, uh, with, with, uh, Lewis Cole and Knower. Are you familiar with Knower? They're, they're, uh, Lewis Cole is one of the biggest mm. modern session or cats. Now he's a drummer. He's a multi, multi-instrumentalist. A lot of his stuff ends up on YouTube and on love, Facebook. Love he's a monster. Nick's no, toured with him. Nick's done a ton of stuff. 
Yeah, right. Nick's toured with Noah and that kind of thing. So, yeah, Nick is definitely one of the top guys in the business right now. Yeah, great, great suggestion. Thanks. You bet. Now, the other Absolutely. question we ask all our guests, Mitch, is the five Desert Island discs, so the five records you yeah. could not live without. That's a hard one. Believe me, I've been thinking about that ever since... Ever since we talked, ever since we talked about me being on the show and hearing you ask everybody that, okay, I I, I, I can definitely give you the first couple. Okay, if, for jazz organ, if there's one record that I think you could listen to and it would cover everything you would need to hear, there's a record by Joey D. Francesco called Snapshot, and it's a live record that he did with his trio of 25 years. Paul Bolenbeck on guitar and Byron Lanham on drums. And it's called Snapshot. It it covers every there's there's straight ahead, there's blues, there's gut buckety kind of stuff, there's twisted standards, there's modern stuff, there's it's just if there's one record of Joey D. Francesco's that I would that I had to if, if I could just pick one, that's the one. You could learn just about everything you needed to know about jazz organ off of that one record. So that's called Snapshot. The second one is uh, Back to Oakland by Tower of Power. So when I was uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I got a ride home from choir practice from this really cool senior named Doan Baber, who had an old Cutlass Supreme with the T-tops off, and it was a summer night. I remember this vividly, guys. This was one of those moments where you're like, my life has changed. And he gave me a ride home from choir practice, and he put in a tape of Back to Oakland, and the song Squib Cakes came on. And I was like, "Yeah, what, what, what is that? What is that? And he's like, oh, that's, that's Tower of Power. I'm like, what, what, what instrument is that guy playing? He's like, I th- I, he goes, I think it's a Hammond organ. That was my first exposure to Tower of Power. And it just, I discovered Tower of Power at Emerson, Lake, and Palmer at the same time when I was in high school. And my brain just, you know, but what's... <laughs> that but, is a combo. Right. But what's the common thread? The Hammond organ, right? I mean, there's two totally different approaches, but there was something even back then before I even knew what a Hammond organ was, that that's what it was. So Back to Oakland is a very influential disc to me. Uh and, I, the third one, it's got to be Speak No Evil by Wayne Shorter, which is Herbie Hancock, Elvin Jones, Ron Carter, Freddie Hubbard, classic blue note. I've always said that if an alien came down and said to me, Earthling, what is jazz? I would play the album Speak No Evil. It's just so, it's just so great, you know, as far as just that's the sound of 60s blue note jazz is that record. Okay, so now the next two, it, here's where I'm going to try to squeeze <laughs> squeeze more than five in. But I had to, I, I, I got to go, and this might be a, a, a left fielder for you. 90125 by Yes. Okay. That, that's my era of Yes. You know, like I said, I got into ELP and Yes around the same time. But right around that time was when 90125 came out. And I love that record. The production, the the layered keyboard parts, Trevor Horn's production is fantastic. All the compositions are great. That is, that's a top five record for me. I just love, I mean, I have, there's a spot in my heart for prog rock, you know, and that's kind of pop prog, I guess, you know, but still leads more towards prog. But that record, you know, I've got it in a frame hanging in my studio, you know, I just love that record so much. And so then the next... Let me just the 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 way it is by Bruce Hornsby was a yeah. major influence. Uh, Bruce is one of the people that I have always looked up to, and have watched his career develop. You know, from that first record, I remember hearing the way it is the first time, and I was like, I'm gonna follow this guy. This is my new guy. You know, I was in high school, but I was like, this is my new favorite artist, and I'm gonna follow his career. You know, this is gonna be. This is the guy, and he has done that. He's just, he's had such an amazing, vast career playing with everybody. The fact that people call him up to gum play on their records because of who he is, because of his sound. He's got a unique sound. You can hear Hornsby 
like that absolutely anytime and i finally saw him live for the first time a couple months ago with the symphony here in omaha you know i mean he is a huge hero to me and by 5b would be would be gaucho by steely dan because when i discovered steely dan later in high school it's like okay well this is going to be my favorite band now because it has all the elements of everything that i've ever wanted to do you know and so and i picked gaucho just because i think it's such a wonderful sounding record it's produced impeccably to its depth some people have like criticized how impeccable it's recorded but to me and it's got a special place in in my heart now here's time for the shameless plug in july srt is going to be doing a week in new york at birdland which is wow. and, uh, and i'm extremely excited about that and cool. we're have and a special guest for that whole week is going to be saxophonist tom scott who is kind of the jr of saxophone i mean that guy has been record his his recording resume is as ridiculous as jr's is and he played on asia and he played on gaucho and did the horn arrangements for both those records and so now i'm going to be doing a freaking week at birdland with jr robinson and tom scott you know it's like that to me i'm still a little you know yeah. i don't think i'll ever get over that you yeah. know so there's my shameless plug yeah, for amazing. getting to play with tom scott coming up so that's why i wanted to get gaucho in there because he's the he's the tenor player on on the title track of that that's brilliant. No, great picks, and and you probably had the you're the last of our guests to have the hardest job with that. In that we've started compiling all those top five. I saw on that. The website. Yeah. So yeah, so everyone can now review what everyone else. Said. I didn't look so, at any of those. Be... I've only listened to the other. I I've just listened to what other people have said, and and I'm I pretty think sure maybe I've got did, one of the you... most varied lists. Yeah, and I think you've picked. I don't think you've um, duplicated one from the I don't previous seventy. So. I think they're all unique. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because David David Matthews picked in in the slot by Tower. I heard that the other day. He picked in the slot, and I picked back to Oakland. So I didn't I go. didn't duplicate. No, good stuff. And then um, our last um, well, it's not our last questions. Our quick fire ten questions, Mitch. So short oh, okay. and sharp answers yep. to ten quick questions. Paul. Well, you're muted. What's the first keyboard you ever owned? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I was ready with this story. When I was in high school, I drove a crappy old car. I drove a 72 Honda Civic. It was a beater. And one day after school, I got rear-ended. And so it was the other person's fault. And so I got, uh, I got a settlement of 350 bucks. And so I thought, now, am I going to put a new bumper on this beat up old car or am I going to take this $350 which is just about the exact amount of a brand new Casio CZ 101 there was no there was no decision to be made I bought a Casio CZ 101 was my first legit synthesizer and I wish I still had it because that was an actual analog synth and it sounded like it was four voice polyphony but it sounded great you know, so yeah. that was that was my first keyboard because I got rear-ended. <laughs> That's great. Love that. That's excellent. Um, your most important pre-gig ritual, Mitch? Coffee. I like to just to get a cup of coffee and just hang out. Also, sometimes I'll hang out by myself. I'll find a place, you know, and just kind of just... Uh, just have a cup of coffee and just kind of clear my head and get ready for the show. Keytars, are they... Sexy, or are they an abomination? <laughs> they are very cool when it's Chick Corea playing a KX5 in a jumpsuit. Other than that, uh, maybe Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis back in the day with Morris Day, but mostly you're not going to be cool with a keytar. Great. Um, I tend to agree with everyone on that. Um, transpose button. I think I know the answer to this one, Mitch, given your organ and piano yeah. predilections. But transpose button or adjust on the fly? Adjust on the fly. you got to play it in whatever key the singer wants to do it in. What's the... You can't transpose date? an organ. The only time an organ transposes... Oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say the only time an organ transposes is if the power is if the power supply isn't strong enough and it drops like a half step. So then you then you got to transpose on the fly in your head. But yeah, there's no transposing on a Hammond organ. Not or on a or on a piano for that matter. Um, right. So uh, to date, Mitch, what is the favorite gig you've done? <sighs> Um, you know, it, uh, there are, I don't know about favorite gig, but there's gigs that I look back on and think, wow, that was really something magic happened that night. And that's one of the things I like about playing uh, a more improvisational style of music is that, you know, something can happen amazing every night. And uh, it's funny, I had gone out to LA to do the SRT recording session. And I had done nothing but shed that music for like a month up until that session. And that session was on like Tuesday and Wednesday. I came back on Thursday and on Friday here in Omaha, I had a straight ahead jazz gig with this amazing guitar player who I mentioned earlier, Dan Wilson, who was in Joey D's band. And Dan is one of the most monster cats out there right now. And I'm just like, I, I'm, you know, I haven't had a chance to, because because I take pride in shedding music and having people's music ready, and I hadn't had a chance to shed Dan's music, and it was hard, you know, and we're doing Kenny Garrett tunes and some of his tunes and a Kenny Kirkland tune, and I was just like, oh my God, I'm going to just fall on my face. That gig was on fire, and it's some of the best playing I've ever done, and it was just like, I was, I was just like, wow, that was really special, and so I'm thinking, though, that gig was extremely special. The last SRT gig I did where we did the DW Drums 50th anniversary, that was our first live performance. That was very special, you know. And that Marcus Lewis gig that I mentioned that changed my mm. whole trajectory 10 years ago was extremely special. Yeah, good peaks. Uh, favorite gig you've ever attended as an audience member? Oof. Um, wow. Uh... You know, okay, this is this is this is the one that comes to mind, but it's a little left field, maybe. Um, there, uh, I saw Kurt Smith was half of half of Tears for Fears, Roland Orzabal and Kurt Smith, and then they parted ways. And Kurt Smith in the mid '90s put out a record called Mayfield, which was fantastic. And I went to see him at a club, and there were maybe seven of us there. And it was an amazing show. And they put on that show for seven of us. And I talked to him afterwards. He was super nice, you know. And it was just a show that I always look back on and go, I can't believe more people were at, weren't at that show. Yeah. But it's just, it's, just, it's just a show that sticks out of my head. It's, it, it wasn't maybe the greatest jazz show I ever saw or any that kind of stuff. But it's, 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 it's one that sticks out as just being very special. Because it felt like it was just for me and my friends, yeah. you know. What's the thing you love the most about playing live? The interaction with the other musicians. I am not a solo player. I've never been somebody that sits down at the piano player at the, or at the piano and works out a thing and you know sings an Elton John song by himself. I practice to play with other people, and that's why the pandemic was so hard, was because I wasn't going to get to to do that for the foreseeable future. But it's getting on stage and like I said earlier, when something could happen, or it's like the first time you play with a drummer, and you and I, and you and you and the drummer both do the same figure at the same time, and you're like, okay, this is going to be a fun night. You know, it's like there's something, something special can happen with this group of players that can't happen in any other situation. I love getting up in front of people and playing. People ask, do I get nervous? I get excited. You know, when I get nervous is when I'm working on the material earlier. It's like when I first get a book of tunes from somebody, it's like, oh boy, I hope this shit isn't really hard. I hope I can do it. And most of the time, you know, I can do it. But I, that's when I get nervous is in the prep phase. By the time I get to the stage, I better not be, I better have this stuff under my fingers and just be excited about playing. Yeah. Oh, great. Worst thing about playing live? <clears throat> uh we have my friends and I always refer to um, we call them uh, ambivalence gigs where the crowd c 
couldn't care if you were there or not. They don't actively hate you. They don't actively like you. They're just apathetic. They're apathy gigs, not ambivalence. Apathy. The apathy gigs where people like try to actively like move away from the stage. You know, they're like trying to have a conversation and you're interrupting them because you're in the band. You know, those are the those are the worst gigs. Those are the hard ones. Name one thing that, if it was invented, would make your life as a keyboard player easier. <laughs> a 30-pound Hammond organ. One that was actually, yes. that actually had all the innards, that had all the sounds. Like I said, clones are getting really close, but one of the big things that they can't replicate is the feel of the keys because most of them use a Fatar key, key bed, which is like this, you know, well, I think Hammond makes their own, but they all have a short fulcrum, whereas an actual Hammond key has a very long fulcrum and presses down a certain way. Nothing feels that way. And, I mean, as, as much as I've listened to Joey DeFrancesco, for instance, if I listen to a record where he's playing a clone, I can hear it. I can hear it not only in the sound, but in what he goes to execute. It's like, and he's, bear in mind, he's killing on whatever he's playing on, of course, but I know his playing so well that I know what he goes for and what he maybe doesn't go for because he knows the keyboard won't play back. And so that's for me, it's like when I'm on a clone, it's like it, it reduces the amount of ideas I have maybe by about 10 or 15 percent, depending on the clone, because of the sound and the feel. It's like my brain, autom like if I'm playing on a really heavy piano, my brain adjusts to, well, I know I can't do that, that Kenny Kirkland line. You know, maybe I'll play block chords, you know, because I know my hands know what what my or, or my brain knows what my hands can't execute. So if somebody could develop a real feeling ham and organ, that's about 30 pounds, that would make life great. Great, great answer. And then your favorite <laughs> non-musical activity hobby. What keeps you sane outside of music, Mitch? I like to watch like good television, good prestige shows, you know, uh, I like to read just any, I like to feed my brain with like good things, you know, not just, you know, I just don't watch mindless television. I try to watch shows that are, you know, intriguing comedies, even, you know, just anything that's like smart, you know, or just something. So, that's, so supplementary that's question, T, yeah. supplementary question, TV recommendation, the name of show that you're loving at the moment. I just finished Severance. Oh, which, oh yeah. <laughs> that's such a great show. I and love that And I'm very, very excited about the return of Succession. Succession is a show that I think I will watch over and over for the rest of my life. I love yeah, I Succession. Need to get into that. Oh, dude, you need to get it's into very that. Cool. Paul, it's yeah, very cool. Dude, that is one it. of the... Yeah. One of the Oh, it's just yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and I, I'm aware it's loosely based on the Murdoch Empire, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm very keen to see it's that. It's yeah. the writing. It's it's drama and comedy in the, in the per, it's at, at the same time. I love it. I, it it comes back on in a couple of weeks, and I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. So I love Excellent. Succession. Great stuff. <laughs> Mitch, that was absolutely superb. Can't thank you enough, and I feel like we do need to come back and, and get together again in the future and talk about organ clones. I think you've... Anytime. an idea there amongst Paul and I. I think we'll, we'll be talking about that. Um, but hugely appreciate your time today. You need to go and have some dinner. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it so and much. really Thank you for appreciate me. it. Thanks for coming on awesome. our show, Mitch. It was great chatting to you. Paul, the temptation is to say, after every show, I feel incredibly illuminated. And it's certainly the case with this one. I, I learned a lot. Yeah, but same. And, and I, I've been on record more than once on this podcast saying I'm pretty dumb when it comes to Hammond organ. So it was, I learned so much and not just about organ, but just some real great playing philosophy tips and ideas. Yeah, no, re really, really good. So huge thanks to Mitch for joining us. Can't, can't thank him enough. And um, don't be surprised if we see Mitch back um, in the future to talk organ clones. I think, I think that's an actually, you know, great area to cover off in a little mm. bit more detail. So again, um, we're, we're, we're done for this episode. We look forward to being back in a couple of weeks and we've got a lot of uh, interviews coming up. So it's a busy period of time for us. Um, but I want to give a quick shout out to our supporters. Um, so number one is Brother Paul Brown from the Waterboys. 
again, if you're on Facebook, follow uh, Brother Paul Brown on on from the Water Boys because just the pictures he um, posts and he he's just been touring again this week with the Water Boys. Some of his guitar picks, he actually does make it sexy. I've got to say, I've said it before. He he proves disproves the point of it being an abomination, even though I tend to think they are. So <laughs> good on you, Brother Paul Paul Brown from the Water Boys. Um, Tammy Catcher, Tammy's Musical Stew, always appreciate your support, Tammy, and do check out Tammy's Musical Stew on Facebook and the wonderful um, curated episodes that you can see on there from all sorts of genres and eras. Um, the musicplayer.com forums and the keyboard corner in particular, uh, it's been a happy home for us for a lot of years. Um, Radio Grande, a YouTube channel devoted to bring you Funk and Soul Reimaginings. They've got a new song coming out in the next couple of days. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful funk reimagining of Never Tear Us Apart from In Excess. And finally, a new supporter, Midnight Mastering. Now, this is, it doesn't get much more relevant than um, our listeners. If you're creating your own music, it's always a good idea to get mixing and mastering done. I've personally used Midnight Mastering for my own, and I'm not going to spam people with my ambient, my, my ambient names or links, but... I could not possibly be happier. Um, Mike at Midnight Mastering has truly transformed what I did with my songs and I, I probably would have been more reluctant to release them aside from what he did. So go to midnightmastering.com uh, and you will not be sorry. Very reasonably priced and, and get those songs mixed and mastered. So thank you all, though, for your support. So keep in touch, keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, very briefly, because no one else listens but Joe Mascara. Now, at this t a stage, we do have a new page set up with all those top five album picks. The Desert Island discs are all on there from episode one through to the current episode. You can even click through to the Spotify playlist. It has over 3,107 songs as of now on it, which are all those picks. And you can also click through and buy the albums. And it is an Amazon affiliate link. It does help us, but I don't, you know, just buy it however you like. Um, but it is a, a real repository of information and just proves I have no life setting that up. Um, we're on Facebook at The Keyboard Chronicles, Twitter at The Keyboard CHR1, and good old-fashioned email editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Last one, patreon.com, Keyboard Chronicles. So thank you, Paul, for joining me as always. Mate, as always, an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, thank you all for listening out there and we'll see you back here next episode.